Chapter 3, The Woods Trail Gritting her teeth against the pain and keeping her walking stick ahead of her to slow her progress, Charlie manages to get down the rest of the hill. At the bottom, the trail levels out and crosses the embankment that separates Hawk Pond, the first of two feeder ponds from the lake. The trail here is easy walking compared to the hill Charlie has just come down, an even steeper hill that she'd have to climb on the other side. She's just thinking how grateful she is for this when she notices that the greenery crowding the trail on both sides is dark and shiny and three-leaved. Someone has been keeping the trail open, but just barely. Poison Ivy is pushing in toward her bare arms and legs. There's more Poison Ivy out here than Kudzo and Barbed Wire Vine and Honeysuckle put together. Charlie catches her breath and stops. No, she does not want this voice, this clear, unmistakable voice in her head. This is what she's been afraid of, why she doesn't walk the trail. It is too late not to have heard it. She's here at the wild end of the lake, right in the middle of her mother's world. Here, where her mother used to come day after day, season after season, year after year, to take the nature photographs that made her famous. The photographs that eventually took her away forever. Charlie shakes her head as if she can shake memory away. Focus, she tells herself firmly. Pay attention to this moment, to the reason you are here, nothing else. Since the day her father, his face gray, turned from the telephone to tell her about the plane crash in the Brazilian rainforest, Charlie has worked at closing down the past. She has gotten very good at it. Ahead of her, Sadie is standing chest deep in the pond drinking. Charlie looks around for the wild dog. He's nowhere to be seen. This is crazy, she thinks. Just crazy. If it weren't for the wild dog, she would never have come here, stirring up memories, raising her mother's voice in her mind. She swallows hard a couple of times around the sharpness in her throat, and then begins moving carefully forward, concentrating on staying in the very middle of the trail, using her walking stick to fend off the poison ivy that seems to be reaching out at her. She will have to remember to wash really well when she gets home and hope for the best. When she reaches the end of the ivy patch, she crosses the water trickling into a foot-wide foot crack in the old concrete spillway between pond and lake, and stands for a moment facing the hill ahead of her. She needs to rest before tackling it. A tree has fallen into the pond, dragging up a mass of red dirt where its roots broke free of the hillside. The roots reach out towards the trail. She grabs one and pulls herself up the first steep rise, pushing with her stick. Then she manages to clamber onto the wide trunk that stretches like a bench toward the water and she sits, aware of the throbbing in her leg, doing her best to keep her mind on this moment. It's no good. She's looking across the water as her mother used to, camera poised, waiting for a heron to come straight through the reeds, a kingfisher to settle on a branch over the water, or the pond's resident muskrat to come out of its den beneath the embark embankment. Even now, a photograph of that muskrat, nose barely breaking the water's surface, early sunlight glinting on the ripples at a V out behind, hangs on the wall of the lake room. The day of the funeral, Charlie took every single one of her mother's photographs down from the walls of her room, but her father left others up all over the house. She has learned to live among them without seeing them. She shifts her gaze away from the pond and sees the wild dog at the other side of the poison ivy patch, about to come through. He catches her looking at him and stops. He looks like what he is, a starving, frightened, probably abused dog. There's nothing beautiful, nothing magical about him. What has she been thinking? Sadie comes up out of the pond, shakes water all over Charlie. Then she runs back through the ivy to pounce on the wild dog. The two of them tussle briefly, and Sadie comes running back. The wild dog doesn't come with her. He is standing up the far hill now, sheltered by the trees. Charlie remembers she has promised him food. She doesn't break promises. Anyway, she's already here, has already shaken the memories loose. She will rest till her leg is ready to climb this hill, and then she'll keep her concentration carefully on each step she takes all the way home. She can, she will. Sadie has already gone ahead up the trail. Come on, she calls to the wild dog. At the sound of her voice, he vanishes into the shadows again. If this dog can't stand her looking at him, can't stand the sound of her voice, Charlie thinks, she won't be able to save him anyway, won't be able to give him a home. Suit yourself, she yells at him. I don't want him, she tells herself as she slides off the fallen tree and starts up the hill. This is the steepest part of the trail, more cliff than hill. In spite of the trees and shrubs growing from between the rocks, she has to use both hands here, 
one for her walking stick, the other to hold on to saplings, roots, branches, anything to drag herself upward and keep her from slipping back. When the trail levels off along a ridge about two-thirds of the way up the hill, the walking becomes easier again, possible at least. She has just managed to get over a gully that is carved a nearly three-foot gap in the trail when she looks up and sees a tree leaning low over the path, the limbo tree. She stops, her mother's voice in her head again. Jack be limbo, Jack be quick. Jump, Jack jump over the limbo stick. She can almost see her mother now, setting her equipment on the ground, bending backward, doing the limbo under the tree. Memory rushes in, herself so little she could walk upright under this tree. And then the day she discovered she'd grown enough to have to bend herself backward the way her mother did. The way her mother took a picture of her doing the limbo for the first time. Charlie shakes her head again. Nothing but a downed tree, she tells herself. One of the hundreds of trees that Hurricane Hugo and its tornadoes toppled all around Eagle Lake. It's just one that happened to get its topmost branches caught among the standing trees so that it didn't fall all the way to the ground. That's all. The tree is leaning closer to the ground than she remembers. Or maybe in these two years she's grown that much taller. Its bark is falling off in chunks and the tree itself is disintegrating. There are bits of dark, rotted wood littering the trail. Sadie comes thundering back down the trail as if she wants to know why Charlie has stopped. I'm coming, I'm coming, Charlie tells her. Then, slowly and deliberately, she bends forward. Forward, not back, to duck under the tree. Chapter 4. Feeding Twice more along the trail, Charlie has to stop and rest, once on a boulder and the other time on a tree stump. She hasn't seen the wild dog since Hawk Pond, she thinks as she sits on the stump, so she's been saved from herself. She doesn't have to keep her promise if he doesn't come with her to get fed. Sadie can swim home and Charlie will take the can of dog food back to Mrs. Davis the next time. Weeks and weeks from now, she feels like walking all the way around the lake. No sooner has she thought this than she catches a glimpse of movement and sees a red gold form slip quickly across the trail back along the ridge she has just walked. If she hadn't stopped to rest, she'd never have known he was still there. Somehow, he can move through the woods with no sound at all. Sadie is another story, charging around in the dead leaves, splashing into the water to take a swim when the trail winds down near the lake, coming back to shake on Charlie, then rolling on the ground to dry herself. Charlie could have closed her eyes any time on the walk and known exactly where Sadie was. Besides that, no raccoon or muskrat, no fox or beaver with half a brain would show its face within a mile of Sadie. This is why she has never had a dog. Nature photography requires patience and stillness, quiet, nothing chasing animals away. But there is no one doing nature photography anymore. She can have a dog now if she wants. When she and Sadie come down out of the woods and cross the embankment at Heron Pond, the smaller of the two ponds, half choked with cattails, Charlie hasn't seen the wild dog again, but she knows now that not seeing him doesn't mean that he isn't around somewhere, among the trees, keeping pace with them. She's picking her way across the Heron Pond spillway on broken chunks of concrete, listening to the cheerful sound of the waterfall, where the water slides over a tumble of boulders on its way to the lake, when Sadie runs past her, splashing her with mud and water. It feels so good on her hot, sticky skin that she wishes she could climb down and sit under the waterfall, letting it wash away the sweat and grime. What she wants more, though, is to get home, wash the poison ivy off, take a pain pill, and lie down for a while. At last, she emerges from among the trees onto the broader swath of trail that is the sewer line access for the housing developments up beyond the wood that surround Eagle Lake. Every couple of years, the utilities people come with a truck and mow down the poison ivy and blackberry brambles, the honeysuckle and sweet gum saplings that grow so fast and thick that they practically choke off the trail between cuttings. She follows it across a tiny creek and up the last slope to the chain that stretches across the end of Eagle Lake Drive. The chain is low enough to step over. Jasmine and Bernie, the two German shepherds who live at the last house on the north side of the lake, bark at Sadie from their pen down near the water as she goes by. Sadie st stays well away. Jasmine, the younger shepherd, sometimes attacks other female dogs, so Mr. Garrison, their owner, keeps them penned while he's at work. When Charlie gets home, Sadie is with her, but the wild dog is not. As she starts down the driveway toward the house, she hears Jasmine and Bernie barking again. A minute later, the wild dog comes down the road, sh shoulders hunched, nose up, sniffing for danger. 
He really does look like a coyote, Charlie thinks, rangy and wild. As she watches him, brave in the open road to follow them, his eyes meet hers for a moment. Again, there's that feeling like an electrical current between them. Coyote, she thinks the word toward him as if she were saying it out loud. That's your name, Coyote. She makes her way down the driveway, up the ramp, and through the sliding door into the dining room. The vacuum cleaner is running in her father's bedroom. Sarita, her eternal jigsaw puzzle abandoned on its table by the windows overlooking the lake, is working. Sarita, she yells, not sure she can be heard. I'm back. The vacuum stops. You okay? Yeah. It isn't true, but as long as she isn't actually dead, she's okay enough for Sarita. Charlie figures she's just another chore for this woman her father pays to run the household, like the laundry or a room that needs vacuuming. She takes a can of dog food into the kitchen and opens it, then gets out a heavy serving bowl. Hurrying, she spoons out the food, cube-shaped chunks of meat with gravy, and goes to see if the dog is still out there. If Sadie starts for home, Coyote will surely follow her. It takes her a minute to spot him across the road, almost in the woods, standing and watching the house. She sets the bowl on the buffet and opens a sliding door. Then, stick in one hand, bowl in the other, she steps out onto the ramp. Instantly, the dog disappears into the woods. Charlie can hear Sadie swimming for home, making big splashes with her front paws the way she always does. Lunchtime, Charlie calls to the wild dog she can't see anymore. Come get it! She limps out to the end of the drive and sets the bowl down where the cement meets the gravel. Lunchtime, she calls again. Charlie steps back from the food and waits for the dog to come out. He doesn't. So she turns around and goes back to the house. When she gets to the ramp, she turns to watch. Still, the dog doesn't come out. Finally, she goes all the way back inside and closes the sliding door. She moves to the dining room window to watch. Sarita, tall and lean as a heron in her faded blue jeans and navy t-shirt, comes down the hall from the bedroom. What's up? There is no way to know what Sarita would think of having a dog in the house. She is as communicative as a statue. But it isn't Sarita Charlie has to convince. It's her father. Charlie motions Sarita to the narrow window by the front door. Watch, out on the drive. The dog comes out of the woods and stands for a moment, looking toward the house. Then he crouches low to the ground and begins to creep up on the food dish, as if it might be booby-trapped. He sniffs at it quickly, then backs away. He goes to his right, his left, and over his shoulder, sniffs again, then begins creeping forward, his tail tightly tucked between his legs. He wants the food, Charlie can see, really wants it, but he seems terrified of it, too. Finally, standing as far back from the bowl as he possibly can, he stretches his neck to reach the food. He wolfs a couple of bites and then backs up to check all around again, muscles tensed and ready to run. That's the stray from the other side of the lake, Sarita says. How'd you know about him? Saw him a couple times up by the mailboxes. Scooted off when he saw me, though. Scruffy-looking thing. The dog goes on eating, gulping quickly, stopping every couple of mouthfuls to check for danger. When he finishes, he slips back into the woods. Mrs. Davis says nobody can get near that dog, Sarita says. Nobody can. So how come you're feeding him? Because he's hungry. It's more than that, she knows, but Charlie can't explain it even to herself. I'm thinking maybe he can come live with us. Ha! Sarita says and runs a hand over her fine frizz of gray hair. What's your father gonna say? I don't know. Whatever he says, Charlie thinks, surprised at how strongly she feels. Suddenly, she will find a way to have this dog in her life.